all the many questions that people Google and search for online. And actually, many of those are fun and silly. And I'm the queen of Google. I love to Google. I love to Google a fact because why not know the answer to something? It's right there. And there's no reason to have any question unanswered. And so much so that I've been dubbed in my family. I have a nickname, Moogle. Mom and Google. So they call me Moogle because I love to know information. And if you ask a question, I don't like to just let it sit there and linger. John will tell you, why can't you just be okay with the mystery of it? No, I want answers. I always want the answer. So I'm going to Google it. But the reality of it is, is that a lot of times people actually Google really serious questions. You saw some funny questions up there, but many times people do go to the internet and look for questions and to the answers to those difficult questions in life. So this series that we're tackling called, Can I Ask That?, Maybe a question that you've Googled or searched for online, but you've wondered, can we really talk about that in the church? Or maybe you've wondered, why isn't the church talking about that? It's a question everybody has, and yet the church isn't talking about that. And so we're attempting to tackle some of those questions in this series. It'll be a four-week series. And as you saw on uh, the screens, this week we're going to talk about why does my sexuality matter to God? And then we are going to tackle topics like politics, mental and physical health. And then finally, we're going to talk about death and eternity. Because these are questions that people are asking today in our society. So, if you'll go with me to Genesis chapter 1. That's where we're going to be here in just a minute. And I'm going to read from the NLT. But here's the... What I want to unpack for you today. Why does my sexuality matter to God? And I want to propose two reasons. By the way, this is by no means a complete and comprehensive um, assessment of sexuality and sexual sin. We are just establishing a baseline of how we can all agree in this conversation today. And also, I want to say this before I begin. If you are new to Calvary... I want you to know that Calvary Church is a church that will always endeavor to preach the truth of Scripture without apology, but we will always endeavor to preach it in love. We understand that we are all fallen people who need God's grace and mercy. None of us is above being tempted to sin, and none of us is perfect by any means. So I want to establish that before we launch into this today. So why does our sexuality matter to God? Well, I'm going to propose two reasons today. The first one is that we, the way we express our sexuality is meant to reflect God's image. And when we say his image, we're talking about his character and his nature that was stamped on us at creation. The second reason why our sexuality matters to God is that the way we express our sexuality is meant to point to the kind of spiritual relationship that God wants to have with each of us. And so it, when we deviate from God's plan for our sexuality, you can see that it will distort our view of who God is, his image, his character, his nature. And it will distort our understanding of the kind of relationship that he is pursuing with us. That is exactly what the world and ultimately the enemy of our souls is trying to do. So let's dive a little deeper into our first reason here. Number one, our sexuality is meant to reflect God's character and nature. This is where we're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the, in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now we're going to skip down to verse 31. 
Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came marking the sixth day. You see, this was the final day of creation. God had created um, the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, the skies, the stars, all the animals, and his crowning glory of creation was human beings who would be like him, like no other creation was like him. There is no other thing that is created that is like man and woman, created in the image of God. So I want to break down for you exactly what that looks like. How is it that we are created similarly to God, but different than all other creation? Well, the first attribute of God I want to talk about, um, well, by the way, I'm going to actually, I'll tell you all three of them and then we'll break them down. How about we do that? So first of all, God is creative. He's relational and he is diverse but unified. And when we say diverse but unified, we're talking about the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are three expressions of who God is, but they exist in complete unity and they are one in essence. So similarly, God has created human beings with diversity, different expressions, male and female, that he meant to experience complete unity. So first of all, God is creative. We just said God spent six days creating. And so our sexuality is also meant to procreate. In Genesis 1, 28, we read, then God blessed them, said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry on the ground. Be fruitful and multiply. Go create as I have created. Go and be like me. Reflect my image to the world as you create just as I have created. The second way we image God is that God is relational. So our sexuality is meant to image a covenant relationship, a faithful relationship. In Genesis 2.18, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper that's just right for him. You see, we may think, oh, I just need God and I'll be okay. But God actually says we need each other. And very specifically, God says that man needs woman and woman needs man. And so he created that relationship to image that, that covenant relationship that shows us who God is and the type of character and nature that he has. And that is what the marriage union reflects for us. And finally, and I'm gonna spend a little more time on this one because it's a little more complex. God is diverse but unified. So our sexuality is meant to be expressed in diversity that is also unified. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we see that God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. You see, those plural pronouns are not an accident. They are very purposeful. They are there to uh, point us to the triune nature of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They were there together in the beginning. They've always been together. Three distinct expressions of who God is. Similarly, male and female, God created them. Distinct expressions of humanity, distinct expressions of image bearers of God, if you will. In Deuteronomy 6.4, there's a prayer called the Shema that's pulled from the scripture, and it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see, even though he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is completely unified in his essence. Those three are completely one. They speak for one another. They are um, always unified with one another. When you get one, you get the three. 
And the word there that means one is the Hebrew word ehad, which means united or one. And we see this exact same Hebrew word ehad in Genesis 2:24, where it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The same word that describes God as one is used to describe the marriage union and its oneness. Linda Seiler says this, all humanity, but especially the union of a marriage of husband and wife, images the mystery of God's unity in diversity. You know, there's some things in life that you just have to experience. You can't really describe it. You have to experience it. How do you tell a person what love is, right? Have, has any of you, your kids ever say, how do you know when you're in love? And you're kind of lost for words. How do you describe what it feels like to be in love with someone? Well, you just know, right? Is that, have any of you ever heard that or said that? Well, you just know when you're in love. You'll know when you know. How do you know if it's the right one? Oh, you'll just know. And there are some things that are better experienced than they are described. And so God wanted us to experience his nature as a part of our sexuality so that we would understand the deep love and commitment that he has towards each of us. So to review our first point, because God is, our sexuality should be procreative, happen within a covenant relationship and be diverse while also being completely unified. So we can see from this that any expression of sexuality outside of heterosexual marriage distorts one or more aspects of God's image that we are meant to reflect. And this is why this is so important. This is why our sexuality matters to God. This is by no means a comprehensive list of sexual sins, but I just wanted you to think through a few of them and think about how they distort God's image when we experience or we see others participating in these. Fornication and adultery. Fornication is sex before marriage. This is sex without a covenant. This is not imaging the type of God that we serve. Pornography and masturbation, no covenant, no procreation. These do not image the kind of God that we serve. Homosexuality has no opportunity for procreation and there's no diversity. Pedophilia, rape, incest, no covenant and no unity could come from these violent and abusive acts. You see, if the enemy of our souls can distort our view of sexuality, He knows that he can distort our image of God and our understanding of the type of relationship that he wants to have with each and every one of us. Which brings us to our second point. The way that we express our sexuality is meant to point us to the type of spiritual relationship that God wants to have with each of us. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says, as the scriptures say, A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. In Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb, and his bride has prepared herself for him. You see, all throughout the New Testament, the church, those of us that love and serve Jesus, we are imaged as his bride and he is our bridegroom and we are betrothed or promised to him. And one day we will um, come together at the marriage supper of the lamb and that relationship will be spiritually consummated. And God wants us to have the right idea of the type of relationship that he wants to have with us and the type of groom that he is to us. Lewis B. Smeads says it this way, 
Sexuality as a part of God's image is the human drive towards intimate communion. Thus, sexual intimacy involves at one time the maximum degree of risk if it goes badly and the maximum promise of communion if it goes well. Similarly, Jesus took the ultimate risk. He put himself out there, he gave everything he had, and he made himself vulnerable to us, vulnerable to rejection, vulnerable to shame, to torture, and to death ultimately, so that he could have relationship with us, so that he could experience the ultimate positive side of that coin, eternal communion with each of us. You see, there's not very many things that make us more vulnerable than the sexual act. And God wants us to understand this is the type of vulnerability that he has with us because he wants that kind of communion with us. So he took that chance for rejection and he remains faithful even when we are faithless. You see, God would never use us he would never abuse us, and he will never leave us. So we should model this in our sexuality. We should seek what's best for others and not just what satisfies our temporary physical or emotional needs without regard for how it affects the other person. My goal today is to image the perfect example and not to really single out any specific sin, but really to say anything that doesn't meet this standard is not God's plan. However, there, I have a couple of friends that have been attending Calvary for about a year or two that on different occasions, I think today's actually the first time they've ever met each other. They have come to myself or Pastor John and said, I would like to tell my story someday. I would like to help other people that may be experiencing what I've experienced. And so I have some friends that are here today to be interviewed and I'm asking you, would you please welcome Angela and Tamara to the stage today? This is, a, this is a tough topic, right? This is tough for me to talk about. It's not my favorite thing to stand up here and do, but it is what I believe God has asked us to do today. Um, and so these women are being incredibly brave, inc incredibly courageous. So um, I just wanna honor them and thank them for their courage today. So this is Tamara and this is Angela. And um, they, as I mentioned, have both asked to share their stories um, not because it's fun to talk about your past, but because they believe that God has asked them to honor him with this testimony. And so um, I'm gonna start with Tamara. Tamara, as you and I visited the other day, you told me that you always kind of sensed that you were a little bit different. Can you kind of tell us what you mean by that? Sure. Um, I can remember... Um feeling different since about the age of four. Um, I understood that my mom and dad were both male and female, but what I did not understand is why I was having a crush on our sitters. Mm. Um, it wasn't anything about sexual attraction because at age four, you don't... You, don't experience that. You, you yeah. have no idea what that's all about. Um, it continued... You know, the older I get, it followed me all the way into adulthood. Um, I never talked about it. I just kind of shoved it in, into the back of my mind. And in 1988, I met a man that was in the Marine Corps. We ended up getting married in 1988. And I thought, you know, if I love this man, this man loves me, then these feelings will fade away and it'll be gone. Mm -hmm. Um, I had three children. Um, during that time, we were together for about nine years. Um, he kind of, he broke my trust on several different occasions. And so that kind of 
brought those feelings back. Mm. Um, I was searching for what I wasn't getting in, in the marriage. So the marriage, um, ultimately, it dissolved. Mm-hmm. Um, I left. I took my children with me. But before I did, I remember one night lying in bed, and I was praying, and I kind of, I guess, challenged Satan. Mm-hmm. And I, I told Satan he would not break me. Wow. Um, and it was about a week after that he brought someone into my life that led me down a tumultuous path. Mm-hmm. Um, and that relationship was my first female relationship. Um, and that was just the beginning of a nightmare. I mean, it just went from one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, until finally, um, in 2018, I just, I was done. Mm. Um, I didn't want to be a part of that anymore, but I wasn't sure how not to be a part of that because that's all I really right. knew uh, for about 18 years. Wow. Um, it was scary, yeah. but um, I walked away from it. Yeah. Um, We're going to hear more about that in a minute because I really want you to unpack that. For But first, let's meet Angela. So, Angela, tell us what brought you to have your first same-sex relationship. Well, I had been a Christian for about 17 years, and but I was lonely. Because you, your, your marriage also ended in divorce. Yes, yes. yes. I, I married, and we were married for about seven years, and then it ended in divorce, and um, never had any children. He wanted to wait till we could afford them. Mm-hmm. We still can't afford them after 42 years. <laughs> yeah. So, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's another story. For another day, right? Right. Um, but I, I was tempted, mm-hmm. and I couldn't resist the temptation. It just came out of nowhere, mm. and it, it just blew me away, and I yielded, and then I felt lost, mm. um, like I failed God. He didn't love me anymore. I didn't know what to do. So I started going to the gay church, and then that led to a 22-year relationship. Um, With someone you met there? Yes. Okay. That Mm -hmm. I ultimately, um, I'd been, you know, feeling conviction, but Mm -hmm. uh, I, I ultimately walked away from it. Yeah. So Tamara, so you had said you had been were a Christian for 17 years before this happened. Yes. Uh-huh. And then Christian uh Tamara, you also became a Christian when you were younger in life. The, the seeds of God's word were planted in your life and you were seeking him. So tell us how that came about. Um well, when I was 14, um you know back then, mm-hmm. um you know, people uh Baptist churches would send families around knocking on the doors to see if they could come in and speak with the family. And this particular Sunday, they knocked on our door. Um, My parents allowed them to come in, and they started talking to us about Jesus, salvation. Um, And I remember that was the day that I got saved, and the the man uh, gave me his New Testament. And I, I would carry it everywhere I went, school, um, would read it in between classes and kind of got ridiculed a little bit from some of the other students about, you know, why I always carried it, why mm-hmm. I always read it. But I was looking for answers um, because, again, you know, at the age of four, you know nothing about this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I was looking for answers to to validate that what I was feeling was not wrong, but obviously I didn't find those answers. Um and now and in, into my adulthood, I've realized that when I was four and I was having these feelings, these wasn't something that were coming from me. It was coming from temptations and influence of the enemy. Right. Um, because I feel like he goes after our children because they're young, they're impressionable, they're moldable. They're vulnerable. Um, which yeah. is what we're seeing a lot of today. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I felt like God was continually just tugging at me. Mm-hmm. And I, I also went to a gay church a few times, but it felt more like a 
a social club to me um, than church. And um, there was just always something tugging at me. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew that it had something to do with the life that I had chosen um, and that it just was not where I was supposed to be. So you said you took your Bible to school and you were always looking for answers. <clears throat> when you and I chatted in my office recently, you said, um, they, I, I don't wanna quote this wrong, so correct me if I say it wrong, but that you feel like that um, gay people who are at gay churches, they are looking for one verse, just one verse in the Bible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even myself, I mean, and I would, I can't speak for everyone, but I would think that um, people that are involved in a homosexual lifestyle who want to be close to God, that's what they do. I mean, they, they go through the Bible and they look for just one verse, just one, saying that it's okay to love someone of the same sex, um, but you're not gonna find it. It's not there. Um, but they, st they still search because sure. they, they're, they're yearning for that relationship with God um, but I think, as Angela said, uh, the previous service that, you know, God can't look upon sin. Right. And, um, uh, you know, this is something that is supernatural. I mean, I wasn't strong enough to change it myself. Um, so that came later, um, right. after, you know, 2018, um, I, I never understood, I mean, I prayed for years that God would just mm -hmm. take it from me, just right. take it. If it was wrong, take it from me, and he never did, and I didn't understand that until the experience I experienced in, um, after 2018. Okay, so Angela, you also um, reflected a similar like internal conflict that you were in during your relationship, as Tamara has said. Tell us a little bit about how you how you walked that road of wanting to keep your relationship with God, but also wanting to have this relationship with this woman. Yes. Um, I wanted to believe that God still loved me, yeah. but I couldn't see a way back. Mm. You know, wow. I, I just didn't know how to get back to him. And um, I still felt, it, it wasn't there all the time, but I still felt conviction. And um, I'd kind of put it out of my mind because I really loved the person that I was with. And I, I had had a couple of experiences earlier in my life where people had tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. My mother actually tried to commit suicide right in front of me. Wow. And... Um, I was afraid that if I left the relationship that this person would do something like that. Mm, wow. And so that kind of kept me stuck. Yeah. Because, you know, I didn't want to hurt her, but I, I wanted to, to, to do what was right. Yeah. So. Um, and for a long time, that expressed itself as you were very involved in the gay church, right? I was. I actually preached. <laughs> And um, I took over the church for about six months because our pastor left. Mm. He found another boyfriend and left. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there was much commitment there. But uh, anyway, so I kind of took over the church and, right, you know, uh, stuff. So, But it was hard because, you know, there was a constant what they call cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. where what that means is that you believe one thing, but you act in an opposite way. Right. So there's a constant And you're conflict. always conflicted mm -hmm. because you're... And then also being gay, when you went out, you knew that people were, you know, looking at you and talking about you. I, we even went to a restaurant one time that refused to serve us. Wow. So, um, and you have to live a double life. Mm. You, have, you have to hide, you know, and pretend like we're just friends, you know, or whatever. So, fortunately, though, I didn't get married. Mm. So, <laughs> Not, tell us about no what, when you decided to walk away from that relationship, what led you to that, and then what was that like for you? 
I decided um, after 22 years to that, you know, I couldn't do it anymore. I had to end it. And so I told uh, my partner that I, you know, I couldn't do it anymore. I said, I can't. It's wrong. And I'm going to stop. And so she and I both agreed that we would both walk away from it. Wow. And so, um, and we have, we're still friends. We talk now and then. Um, but um, unfortunately, she has dementia now. But, um, it, you know, we, neither one of us have had another relationship. Wow. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to see her in heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Yeah. So you mentioned, just finally, just to kind of tie a bow on your story, you mentioned that the whole time you were in this conflict that the um, scripture, Romans 12, 1, yeah. was in your mind. And so, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. That's right. The scripture in Romans 1 was in your mind about you were so glad this was the scripture you couldn't get away from, right? You were searching the Bible and teaching the Bible and trying to justify in yourself. But in Romans 1, you said you couldn't get away from the scripture where it says, talks about sexual sins and the degradation of ourselves and how some, at some point God would give people over to a reprobate mind, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm grateful that he did not give me over to a reprobate mind mm -hmm. and that now I have the mind of Christ. Yes. And, um, Amen. I don't, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I no longer have any unholy attractions. Praise the Lord. And then uh, Romans 12, 1. And then, yes, 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 we talked about that one too. Romans 12, 1 says that we are to commit ourselves as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And the word reasonable stands out to me because sometimes we think, well, you know, sex is a human need, so I can't give that up, so that can't be God telling me not to, you know, be in relationship right, or whatever. Right, to abstain, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so we kind of, you know, Put it, put it back in the back of our mind or something. But he's not asking too much of us. Mm, that's good. It, sa it says that he, it's our reasonable servant. It's reasonable because considering what he did for us, yeah. he died on the cross. He shed his blood for our sins. He emptied himself was even abandoned by God for a moment because God can't look on sin, and mm. the Word says that he became sin. Mm. So for a moment, God couldn't look on him, and that's why he said, why have you forsaken right, me? Right. <clears throat> um, but yeah, and so I did that. I committed myself a living sacrifice, and... Um, I'm perfectly fine. Yes. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, Tamara, you, talk, you mentioned a couple of different times how 2018 was kind of a turning point in your life. Tell us what happened from 2018 to now. Um, well, 2018, I ended the last female relationship that I've had, um, and I just felt like I needed to get back into church. I needed to reestablish that connection with God because... I felt like um, throughout the years, the, my pride, um, I didn't want to admit that I was wrong, mm. and I felt like uh, there was a strain or lack thereof relationship with God. Um, so in 2018, I, I wound up, I went to a Christian-based church um, here in Greensboro, and um, the very first service, it was it was as if they were just talking just to me like I was the only person in the auditorium. Wow, yeah. And I remember that was the, the turning moment. Um, so I continued to go. Um, in 2019, I rededicated myself through baptism. It's awesome. And shortly after that, um, I was lying in bed again, praying. And I always listen to music in the background mm. when I sleep. 
And there was a song that Nicole C. Mullins sings. It's called, it's called The God Who Sees. And in the middle of that prayer, I had to stop because there was a, a the, like toward the end of the song, there was a verse that said that, uh, you know, Jesus met Mary of Magdalene and how Mary of Magdalene was um, plagued by demons and tormented by evil spirits, but Jesus set her free. Yeah. And it was like a light bulb just went off in my head. And I thought, that's it. You know, all of these years, my life, um, it wasn't influence of me. It was influence of the enemy that had led me through this lifelong struggle of not understanding and not knowing where I belonged or where I fit in. Or, um, and so in that instant, I mean, the only thing I said was, I choose you. So and good. like that, it was, I can't explain it. Um, it's like I was just, there was peace for the first time in ever, probably. <laughs> um, yes. I felt peace. I felt like a switch had flipped, something had changed in me. Um, I didn't have any more guilt. I didn't have any more shame. I didn't have any more thoughts. And um, that's the way it's been since. I have not had any desire to return back to that lifestyle. Um, I feel like God is leading me into this journey. Um, I've, I've, I'm almost ready to graduate with my degree. And like I told Pastor In counseling, Kim, right? You're at I'm doing a dual major of Christian counseling and Christian life coaching. And Through I, I, I have three semesters. Liberty, right? Liberty mm -hmm, University. Mm -hmm. um, so once I complete these degrees, my goal is um, I want to work with the youth because mm. the youth has had, I mean, our kids have so many things being thrown at them right now. Mm. Um, and it's scary for the parents. It's scary for the child. And um, they have to have advocates. They yeah. have to have somebody that is going to be in their corner and listen and not judge, but let them know that what they're being told is not the truth, mm. but there is a truth, yes. and they need to know that truth. So good. Um, so that, that's my goal. That's so awesome. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, Tamara shared with me in my office, which is important for all of us, is she said one of the biggest struggles that she's currently facing is that it's friendships have been kind of tough because your old friends are still doing the old things. Some of you can maybe relate. And they're like, oh, you think you're too good for us. You don't belong with us anymore. And But now when you're trying to make friends with Christians or even just heterosexual people in general, you feel like maybe heterosexual women are a little standoffish. They're not sure, should I have a relationship with her? Maybe she's gonna have romantic feelings towards me. And so, yeah, am I characterizing that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe it might be based a little bit on my appearance. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, um, but it just seems like you're kind of in an imbalance. Um, now you're kind of like sitting in the middle and you, you have a hard time making friends with female Christians or, or heterosexual women because they may be afraid, oh, she's going to think this or she's going to look at me this way or, or whatever. Um, and then on the flip side, you have these friends that you've known for years and, and, and you may, you know, try to talk to them and tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. And then they're, you know, like, well, what, you know, you're, we're beneath you now. You're mm. better than us. Mm. We're, you know, these evil people now. And so they kind of distance themselves from you. And then, you know, the heterosexual, they mm -hmm. kind of distance mm -hmm. themselves. So you find yourself in the middle pretty much by yourself kind of navigating through this new life. Right. Something um, brand new. And so yeah. it, it can be difficult. Right. Um, it's very difficult yeah. sometimes. Can you guys thank these women for their bravery and courage today? Thank you, guys. Oh, okay. We got one more comment. I just want to say that I'm really thankful that our church is willing to tackle mm -hmm. these subjects because by and large, this is a big problem in society and by and large, churches are just ignoring it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud that we have pastors mm -hmm. that are willing to tackle it. Thank you. Well, I mean, 
you heard it. <laughs> I, I couldn't preach it any better than they have with their lives and their testimonies. And thank God for them. Thank God for what he's, that he would not let them go. You heard them say 18 years, 22 years. God is always constantly pursuing us. He never stops the chase. He is faithful even when we are faithless. So I want to wrap up today by reiterating that we are not coming from a place of condemnation or judgment. In fact, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount tells us that if anyone's looked at someone lustfully, they've committed sexual sin in their hearts. And I don't think that any of us in this room can say we've never been tempted in a sexual way and we've never looked at an image longer than we should have. We've never had a conversation with someone online that we probably shouldn't have had. We never enjoyed flirting with someone that we shouldn't have enjoyed flirting with. And that's the baseline. And beyond that, some of the other things that we talked about today, maybe you're trapped in those today. Maybe it's not just an occasional slip up, but for you, it's a bondage that you're trapped in. And I have good news for you today. Jesus still sets people free. Yes, he is here today. You've heard from these ladies' stories. You've heard from the message that was given, the prophetic message that was given today. God is here. His power is here. He wants to set people free from sexual sins. You know, when the woman who was caught in adultery was brought and thrown in front of Jesus, he said, let the person who's never had this sin pick up the first stone and cast it at her. And nobody was able to pick up a stone because we're all created as sexual beings. And there's not one of us can say we've never been tempted sexually in some way to get our needs met, our physical or our emotional needs met in an unhealthy way. So I don't come from a place of condemnation. I want to come to you from a place of hope because at the end of that discussion with the woman, Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Don't let this thing continue to choke you. Don't let this thing continue to trap you. Walk away from it and walk in freedom. That is the message that we wanna to bring to you today. So how should we respond, Calvary Church? What is our practical way we live this message out? Well, I would propose two things in light of all we've heard today. First of all, we should live out our sexuality in a way that reflects God's image to the world and points to the kind of relationship that Jesus wants to have with us. And second, we should be willing to walk with those who are trapped by sexual sins and help them walk out their journeys towards freedom. People need a community they need a safe space where they can confess what they're struggling with and know that they're not gonna be judged, know that it, no one's gonna tell everybody about their sins, but that they can confess their sins and begin to walk out their healing. You, yes, amen. You may not wanna clap after this next statement, but... <laughs> I'm convinced that the church is way too comfortable with sexual sin in our music, our movies, and our TV shows. And we are not comfortable enough engaging a sinner where they are and helping them walk out their freedom. We have got to flip that scenario, church. We've got to be people that don't smile at sin or laugh at sin, but we will engage a sinner and say, we want to help you up out of this. We're not going to look at you like you're strange or awful or can't be engaged with. We're going to walk this out with you. We're not going to wince when you tell us what you did because guess what? I've had that thought before too. By the grace of God, maybe I didn't act on it or maybe I'm not as trapped in it as you are at this moment. But I've been there too. I've been tempted in all the same ways and I wanna walk this out with you. And I don't care what people think of me that I'm befriending you and helping you walk into freedom. That is, should be our posture today. Would you bow your heads with me in this place? 
Jesus, help us. This is not easy. It's not easy to get free from sexual bondage. It's not easy to talk about these things with people and to be open with one another. And it's not easy to give people answers to problems that maybe we've never experienced. But God, by your grace, with your help and with your mercy, we commit to do all of these things if you'll help us, if you'll be with us, if you'll give us the right words to say, if you'll give us that safe haven, that person that we can talk to, God, we will honor you if you will help us walk it out. That's our desire today. Now, while you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm mindful that there may be some in here today that you've never even thought about your sexuality having anything to do with God. Because frankly, you don't live your life for God, you live it for yourself. And you have recognized in today's message that you feel conflicted inside. And maybe you didn't know why, or maybe you did. Maybe you walked into this place knowing today that you have an internal conflict and it's because you're running from the God who's pursuing you. And if that's you and you wanna experience peace like our sisters have described for us today, then I wanna pray with you and I wanna help you walk forward in peace. Will you raise your hands while everyone's eyes are closed and their heads are bowed so I can see who I'm praying with today and we can help you to walk forward in peace and walk out of the bondage that you're experiencing today. Anybody in this room? Keep your hand up until I acknowledge it. I'm looking around the room. Okay. If you're online with us today and what I've described is reading your mail and you have felt throughout this entire service that your heart is pounding inside of you and you know God is pursuing you, then I wanna speak to you right now. We're gonna all pray in this room together and I want you to pray this prayer in your heart and I want you to believe it as a declaration to Jesus and not just words. Will you all in this room repeat with me this prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for pursuing me. Thank you for never giving up on me. I wanna surrender my life today. I'm tired of running from you. I'm tired of living for myself because it always comes up empty. I confess that I have sinned against you, God, but I want you to wash away those sins, forgive me and restore me. And I believe that your word says that you will forgive me. And that means today I am forgiven. I am a new creation and I am set free in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Church, thank you. Thank you for always being loving and affirming of God's word and of people's real struggles. Thank you for being so good when we cover these tough topics. I wanna invite my prayer team to come down front at this time. If you prayed that prayer in your heart, but you were afraid to raise your hand, somebody here wants to meet with you and help you know what your next steps are. If you need a partner, a prayer partner, a, if you need an accountability partner because you're trapped by sexual sin, maybe you're serving Jesus, but you're also tempted in ways that you keep giving into, somebody will be here to pray with you or if you have any other need, you have a physical ailment or you have a relational need, maybe you have a loved one that you wanna stand in for today, that this message hits home for you because of a loved one that is struggling with sexual sins. We invite you to come down and join together and partner with somebody and borrow from their faith and pray together for that loved one. 
Whatever your need may be today, these people are here, they've been praying all week, and they are ready to meet you and, and go to the throne of grace with you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength for your coming and going. May the God of all peace keep you this week as you walk in truth, as you extend the hand of fellowship to people wherever they are and offer them hope. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. Um, we'll see you Wednesday for prayer and Bible study. Please come down if you want someone to pray with you about anything today for you or your family members.